Rising seas are sinking futures. Sea level rise is not only a threat in itself, it is a threat multiplier. Since 1993, when satellite measurements began, the rate of sea level rise has doubled. 10% of the overall sea level rise has been in the past two and a half years. That, paired with more and more devastating storms and hurricanes, has amplified a flooding crisis for communities around the world to an unprecedented degree. People in parts of smaller island nations like Fiji and Vanuatu are already experiencing forced relocations. And as sea levels rise and storm patterns change for the worse, parts of New York City, America's most densely populated coastal community, could be facing the same threat. So how do coastal communities prepare for the inevitable devastating flooding that will follow? Many of the cities home to over 12 million residents are in coastal locations. Coastal flooding is a big problem because uh, a lot of the human population lives along coasts. And in the U.S., 30% of the population lives on the coast. That's roughly 94 million people. With receding coastlines in Florida and dangerous seawater flooding in New Orleans, the impact from rising seas is already being felt. The peril of flooding is not an abstract danger for residents of New York City, the most populous city in the U.S. Currently, 1.3 million people in the metropolis live in a floodplain. By 2100, that number could rise to 2.2 million. The projected rise in sea levels for New York City by the 2050s is one to one and a half feet, is the central estimate. But the high estimate by 2050, the seas could rise by as much as two and a half feet. By the end of the century, uh, that central estimate of sea level rise is two to four feet, with a high estimate as high as six feet. With higher background sea levels, coastal areas are more prone to flooding during storms. In 2012, New York City was battered by Hurricane Sandy, a so-called 100-year storm. 44 people died, and the damages reached an estimated $19 billion. Thousands were displaced and lost their homes. Since then, the city has moved to flood-proof critical infrastructures such as hospitals, power plants, and major tunnels. A $52 billion proposal by the Army Corps of Engineers has been put forward, creating a series of storm surge barriers around New York Harbor. But the project does not have funding yet, and there's no timetable for its construction. There's no single actor who can eliminate all of the flood risk. So even if you put up a massive set of flood barriers, that system is going to allow smaller floods. So there are other interventions that need to address the damages that the smaller floods are going to cause, such as individuals investing in retrofitting their homes, filling in those basements, or smaller infrastructure along the shore. Dr. Madajowicz and her team documented the cost of damage from Hurricane Sandy to homes and compared them to the cost of retrofitting a home to make it more flood resilient. The results indicated that the measures would save homeowners hundreds of thousands of dollars over the next decades. But many still struggle with the investment into flood-proofing their homes or rely on secondary incomes from renting out their basements. It's not something they can afford or again they have economic benefits from their basements which they rely on for their livelihoods and that's not easy for them to eliminate from their budget. So why don't residents move out of flood prone areas? The other piece of the puzzle is that if you were to even move individuals out of their communities, it's often a very destabilizing trend for, for families that may be, their entire asset is their home. They're not going to get a great buyout on that home. It's the thing that they were hoping that the next generation was going to inherit. This is the one biggest investment that anyone can make is buy a home. Now you're telling me to abandon my dream. Over half of the residents in floodplains in New York City live in areas where the median income is less than $75,120, which is considered low income for families of three in the city. It's not a practical answer to just blame individuals in those zones and to say that they need to move. Economic concerns in communities also can be barriers to implementing climate adaptation projects. Are they going to displace residents? Or is there going to be a neighborhood decline because you put up a seawall outside of the beach and all of a sudden nobody wants to live there anymore? While much of the attention around coastal flooding has been around investments in physical infrastructure, social infrastructure including food, 
Shelter, financial, and legal services for those in need is just as important to prepare for the next storm. There needs to be significant reform in how we get out resources to community partners and to human services organizations. I think one of the directions that we really need to go in is for more voices to be brought into adaptation planning. We continue in a lot of government entities to plan for fraud, paranoia, and pandemonium, but not plan for the fact that a lot of people are actually going to be ready and willing to show up and help. And I hope we'll move towards a model of where we're looking more at that. We have no other choice in New York City but to look at our communities as planners and responders for the future of climate crisis. If we don't look at all of us as being a part of it, it's over. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.